I have your attention. Um, it's a little bit past 6, 6.15, so we're going to go ahead and get started because we have a pretty full agenda tonight. We have some guest speakers, and so I would love to get us started. So I'm Marta Lugo. I am the program administrator with the Office of Civic Engagement, and I'm really pleased to welcome all of you here tonight. Um, so uh, just like to get started, we're going to get started with some welcome remarks from our board chair, Linda Lazat, who represents District 4. Um, she has been on the board for a long time, so I'm going to let her come up here and give her welcoming remarks. Yeah, I, I don't need a long introduction. I've been around long enough. I know who I am. But <coughs> anyway, so first of all, thank you, Martin. Thank you for all your hard work um, in putting this together. Again, uh, I'm Linda Lazat, and I represent District 4, which is basically Cambrian um, and this area. So welcome to my home. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge and thank Director Santos, uh, who's here tonight, our former chair. He represents District 3. And Director Tony Estamera. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Director Tony Estamera is in the back, and he represents uh, District 6. So before I start my uh, remarks, I just have to tell you that once I say my remarks, I've, I've got to run out. Uh, our newly elected uh, council person where I live is having her uh, unofficial swearing in party, so I want to see if I can catch the tail end of that. So it's not that I'm not interested, it's just you can't be at two places at once. So I'd like to start by congratulating all of you for being uh, the first members of our inaugural uh, Water 101 Academy. We received an overwhelming uh, response, over 90 applications. So you are the stars. You are very proud of you. you should be very proud to be the first 21 ambassadors selected for this program. This academy is very important to the board because the board has been looking uh, to educate the community leader, to educate the community, to educate leaders like you about water so that then you can be the ambassadors for us going out. The initial concept of Water uh, 101 Academy uh, is not only to educate the community members uh, about the important water sh issues, local projects, and opportunities, but to also create a network of water champions within your community in which you will help pass on the knowledge and information you gain here to others. And I was telling the people at my table, uh, that's a big task. So if you need help once you're done with this, you don't, you know, you don't feel you're getting the, the information you need or you're not able to, to outreach to the, uh, to the groups that you thought you could, make sure you come back because I, don't, I, I just don't, what I don't want to see happen with this group, and I'm sure Martha uh, is aware of that, is that you're the first group, you're let go, and then you're not followed up with. So it's very important that we, we continue to, to have contact with you and have you engaged in this process. So at the Water District, we do everything within our power to ensure that you have safe, clean drinking water. It's been our mission since 1929. In addition, our mission includes providing flood protection throughout the county, as well as ensuring that we have healthy creek and ecosystems that support a healthy environment for all of us. The Water District is also focused on preparing for the future wet or dry years uh, and to ensure Santa Clara County's 1.9 million residents that they have a reliable supply of water no matter what extreme weather uh, the changing nature and climate may bring us. As you will learn over the next several sessions, the Water District is not only, uh, is not only busy securing, uh, cleaning, and delivering water for today's needs, but we are also busy planning for our future water needs as well, which means looking at how we can optimize a mix of different solutions to ensure that we have a sustainable water supply. And I think you're going to be really surprised. I know I was when I first joined the board, and I thought I knew a lot about in the Water District. To find out what, what our mission is, the three pillars, but also where we get our water from, and I, I know that our, our CEO is going to talk a little bit about that, and you'll learn all about it. That's the whole purpose of of this 101 Academy. Um, so, uh, you know, learning about this and, and making sure that we have, we ensure our future water supply is sustainable, it's because we're facing many changes uh, such as climate change, population growth, and scarce imported water supplies. And when I say imported, I don't mean from another state or another country, and you'll learn where we, where we uh, get a lot of 55% of our water. We're also busy, busy planning for best and worst case scenarios including preparing for emergencies such as flooding, droughts, or earthquakes that may strike at any time. 
And finally, as part of an integrated water resource system, we're working hard to protect and enhance our waterways to ensure that they can all in, that we can all enjoy a healthy ecosystem and environment. In particular, one of my priorities as chair this year will focus on ensuring that all the work that we do at the water dis district has a net positive effect on the environment. Uh, we know some things that we do will have an effect on the environment, but when the day is done, we want to make sure that we have a net positive effect on the environment. It's my belief that by doing so, we improve the quality of life for all of uh, Santa Clara County. To me, improving our environment goes much deeper than ensuring that the, that the health of the local creek ecosystem is accounted for. For example, it should inform our decisions on critical water supply proposals, such as the state's plans to secure water su supply reliability and ecosystem restoration in the Delta. Uh, that's very important, and you'll learn about that. This is why it is so critical that we be at the table and have our voice heard on, as those efforts move forward. Locally, this includes looking at sustainable options like expanding water reuse through our recycled and purif purified water projects, through strengthening our partnerships with all of the cities. Another in, in interconnected uh, issue that I care deeply about and the board does is the growing homelessness crisis uh, we are facing up and down the state. Although this is not our primary mission, our mission is to supply clean, healthy water. We very much need to be a part of the solution. With the increasing number of homelessness living in the creeks, there is a direct impact on our local creeks and on the environment. The pollutants and debris that enter into our creeks as a result of homelessness threaten the health of our waterways. We will need to find solutions that better protect our waterways, but that are both humane and compassionate. And finally, we hope to make great progress this year in moving forward on the proposed expansion of the Pacheco Dam and Reservoir. This is another effort that is a great example of incorporating both water su supply and environmental uh, benefits into a major infrastructure product. <coughs> we have steadily made a lot of progress over the years and I look forward to continuing the great work ahead of us in tackling the challenges that may come. Another priority of mine is financial uh, sustainability. Um, uh, Chair Santos uh, asked myself and two of my board colleagues, uh, Vice Chair Shua and Director um, Keegan, to look at new sources of revenue for us. We can't do everything that we need to do and put it into water rates and impact the, uh, the cost of water. We have to find new new ways of securing funding, whether it's a new measure like safe, clean water, or it's development fees, uh, or it's obtaining funds from the state and federal government. We're, we're going to be looking at those things so that we can continue to do what we do uh, without impacting um, the rates that everyone pays for the water. I thank you for showing up for your community and for your commitment to water in this county. So I'm gonna turn it back to uh, Marta. Again, have a great time, and I'm really sorry to leave. I wanted to hear what our CEO had to say and, and our uh, head of external affairs, but I've heard them before, you know, so <laughs> you guys have fun. <laughs> Good night. Thank you, Marta. All right, so before I invite our guest speaker up to speak, um, I would like to first acknowledge um, our CEO, Norma Camacho, who's here tonight with us. Um, as well as our Chief of External Affairs, Rick Callender, and our Chief of Administration, Tina Yoke. Um, thank you. Um, I'd also like to take a moment for us to go around the room and allow each of you to introduce yourselves. So if you could start with this table with your name and city, and just really quickly so we just get a sense of who's here with us tonight. So I'll start with you. Yes, yes, go ahead. Just your name and the city you live in. So if you use the microphone, everyone can hear you because everyone has different hearing abilities, including Thank you. Hi, my name is Laura Camada, and I'm from Morgan Hill. Hi, my name is Swanee Edwards. I'm from Morgan Hill. Hi, 
Hi, uh, my name is Jenny Santana, and I'm from San Jose, Willow Glen area. I'm Brianna Duarte, and I'm from downtown San Jose. Good evening, my name is Nancy Avila, and I'm from San Jose. My name is Jorge Rubio, I'm from San Jose. Hello, my name is Michael Metz, I'm from Saratoga. I'm Hong Wei from Cupertino. Hello, I'm Greg Pasqua from Sunnyvale. I'm Vicki Essert from Campbell. My name is Bob Behrens from San Jose. Hello, I'm Kristen Apple from San Jose, Cambrian Park area. Hi, I'm Tayana Johnston. I uh, am also from San Jose. I'm Shari Carlett from North San Jose. Leslie Stobie, Milpitas. Good evening, I'm Rebecca Gallardo, and I was born and raised in San Jose and in and around Penitencia Creek. My name is Joshua Williams, I'm from San Jose. I'm Steve Ferri, I'm from San Jose, Almond Valley. I'm Kevin O'Reilly, I'm from Los Altos. Right. Well, it's great to put names with faces, so thank you very much and welcome once again. So now I'm going to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, we have Rafael Chavez. He's a community outreach lead with the Department of Water Resources. He has more than 12 years of combined uh, state experience in the field of public affairs um, and currently serves as a state water project community outreach program lead um, and goes around the state really kind of giving people primers on the state water project. So I will invite uh, Rafael up here. Thank you. All right, good evening, everybody. It's awesome to be here, even though we're sound monotone right now, but we're gonna get into this. Um, so before we get going, uh, who's heard of the State Water Project? Awesome, when I got this job, I had no idea. <laughs> and so that's, so I'm the, I'm the pretty much the litmus test to uh, getting the message out regarding the State Water Project and what it is and it's, a, and it's all, all its magnitude. Uh, so, you know, we're going to dig in. The Department of Water Re Resources is who runs uh, the State Water Project. Who knows about the Department of Water Resources? And we're going to get into that. And the reason, the same reason, I didn't, I had no idea besides applying for the job what exactly the Department of Water Resources did when I got in there. So uh, let's read the, the uh, mission. The mission is to manage water resources of California in cooperation with other agencies to benefit the state's people and to protect, restore, and enhance the natural and human environments. So it's pretty much everything under one umbrella. So sometimes when you, you, get the, you hear that the, uh, that the state is trying to do something uh, weird or something different, it's really not that we're doing that. We're here for the benefit of the, uh, of the, of, of the Californian people. Uh, so let me, let me, my computer just died over here. Let me get this going over here. Okay, so here we go. So first I wanna thank Martha for having me here and then Kristen for making the connection. She's out back there. And so, and then I wanna thank everybody else for having me here tonight. Um, tonight's discussion is brought to you by the letter C for complex and uh, by the number 27 for 27 million. And this will come into, into play as we go along tonight. Uh, the State Water Project is a complex system, a, a, con a complex in issues, complex in many different, to many different customers that we serve. There are different uh, straws all in one glass. Uh, there is, uh, th they're all vying for the same water. People, uh, the farmers, and the environment. 
and we have to look out for all three. Uh, so what makes, what makes water such a challenging issue? Why, why is it so valuable? What, why does it cost so much our, 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 when we look at our water bill? It all starts with two things. It starts with weather, California weather, and it also involve, involves um, our history here in California. Uh, so everything sort of started with us in the gold rush in the way we decided to manage our, our water resource. So we have to manage our water resource. Every time we mess with our water resource, and I'm gonna use that word, we have to figure out that somebody needs to get water, something happened to the environment, and so then we have to handle all these things. We're talking about, we're talking about uh, floods, we're talking about droughts, possibilities, we're talking about dealing with a big system. So we're gonna get into this right now. We're gonna get into ex explaining what the state water project is. So complexity, the state water project, we're gonna talk about state water contractors, power generation and its use, drought and flood control, Sacramento, San, jo San Joaquin Delta, we know it as a Delta here, fish and wildlife protection, recreation, challenges, and our call to action. So just to kind of clarify things, uh, California major water projects are handled like this. There's the federal, the Central Valley project, which starts in Shasta, so if you, if you have a map, if you figure out the map, it starts in Shasta, and we'll put a map up there. So you'll see, uh, we got state, federal, and local, and, and you'll see that anything in uh, the, what looks like to be red is, uh, is pretty much handled by the federal government. So when you heard today that the federal government is uh, uh, interested in loosening up restrictions and releasing more water for farmers, uh, then it's basically everything that you see in that red will come to play. But the state, the state handles its water differently. So, and again, we are looking now for three, the three, the three general entities. Again, we're talking about, we're talking about people, we're talking about farmers, and we're talking uh, again about the environment. None of, none of them is more valuable than the other. We're always looking out for the same thing. So, so with that being said, uh, uh, just to kind of clarify, uh, the state water project starts at the Oroville. The, uh, the federal project starts at Shasta, and then we got our local, our local water projects, uh, and then I'll use for, as an example, we'll use uh, Hetch Hetchy, which uh, takes water uh, from uh, the Sierras, so, and you can follow that green, green, uh, let me see, the, let me see what I got, there you go. You can follow this, this, uh, yeah, there you go. You got the, this green area here, all the way to San Francisco. So they, they have their own water project, uh, as, and we call those local. And you'll see there's different local water projects throughout. LA over here has, even though LA gets a lot of state water project water, they also have their own from uh, uh, starting at this point, if you can see the, the, uh, the arrow there. And then of course San Diego gets uh, water from the Colorado River. So it's a complex system. It's a complex system. And so uh, as we dive in tonight, no pun intended on the water thing, uh, we're gonna go from uh, this point on. This is Lake Oroville, uh, travels down the Feather River. We get to the Delta area. Uh, you guys are here, just in case you didn't know that. <laughs> right there, sometimes people don't realize uh, you know, the, the, how the map lays out. And then we travel all the way down here. So technically, uh, we got a lot of mileage to cover tonight. So we'll get into it a little bit deeper now. So in 1960, uh, California voters approved a 1.75 billion bond measure to construct this whole uh, system of water, starting from uh, the, uh, as you can see right there, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the um, Lake Orville, and then we developed all these different uh, areas here, we'll, we'll get into that and describe them. So 1.75 million dollars, and then w what happened with this 29 state water contractors came into play to this, to pay for this system. 29, uh, the Santa Clara Valley Water District happens to be one of those 29. So th basically they were looking out for the future of this area starting back then. Uh, so construction commenced in 1961. Um, this is the nation's largest state owned and operating water delivery system. And I also wanna say it's one of the biggest in the world. And, and so 
when they said 55% uh, of your water comes from this project, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, this project is moving a lot of water and, and 55% of it, so at least half of your interest should, you should always learn about what this project really is about. So we have 35 storage facilities and what we mean by storage facilities, we mean reservoirs or we call them lakes and we'll look into those. We got 21 pumping plants and uh, uh, about 700 miles of canals and pipe, pipelines, four pumping generating plants so what we mean by pumping and generating plants, just to clarify, that means they can pump, they use energy, and then they can also generate energy. So there's a pumping into a, a reservoir and then it's like pumping back out into a, back into the canal. And we'll see an example of that. Uh, and then we got five hydroelectric uh, power plants, which just purely generate electricity. So the infrastructure of the state water project consists of reservoirs or lakes, dams, levees, gates, pumping plants, hydroelectric plants, four bays, after bays, rivers, delta, uh, California aqueduct, and the north, uh, north and south bay aqueducts. You actually get your water from the south bay aqueduct. Uh, the coastal branch aqueduct, which goes uh, to uh, Santa Barbara, and the uh, east branch extension. Uh, and so we'll see more of that. Um, other major functions of the state water project. And these are very important because we're just thinking of purely just getting water and taking a, a bathing in it, uh, watering our lawn or, or drinking water. Uh, we also have to deal with flood control. So remember the big spillway incident in uh, Oroville that everybody heard about that? That was, a, that was it's, uh, the dams exist uh, for flood control and also for drought control. Uh, it's, uh, so whenever you see a dam, don't just think of a dam is there just to break or something like that. A dam is actually there to keep, uh, uh, give us, uh, keep water there for us in the summertime and uh, to uh, hold back a lot of the water that could flood us out in the wintertime. And then so we, we got storage. So this is water management. So that dam is storing the water behind that uh, and that reservoir. We also have a lot of, we have a fish and wildlife protection programs. Uh, we're working diligently to make sure that uh, we we maintain and restore the environment because a, a lot of the things we've done to the environment uh, have affected us in many ways. We're losing our salmon populations, uh, the Delta smelt in trouble. The way we have changed the Delta, we have to do a lot of restoration projects to, to, to bring back uh, a life to the Delta in a certain way where we can sustain it for a, long, a, a, long, a longer period to come. Now, talking about the Delta, there's a, the most important thing about the Delta that people don't realize is salinity control. Because a lot, there's a lot of talk about when we talk about, and uh, we'll mention water fix here down the way. We're talking about the Delta tunnels and quotes. The water can't go away from the Delta. We got to keep fresh water pr pushing the salt water back out into the ocean. So because because the the whole the whole system depends on fresh water. So we have salt water. Uh, intrusion, salt water coming into the to the uh, uh, delta area. We pretty much all of us are pretty much lost. We will not have fresh water. So uh, sometimes you'll hear the, the you'll hear the slant that uh, we're trying to get rid of the fresh water for the farmers. No, we, we can't. We can't. There's no possible way, especially with the the whole conversation of cli climate change and the oceans rising. That means we got to make sure there's more fresh water than ever before. But the question mark is this. This is, happens to be an awesome year. I was driving in and there's snow even in the Bay Area and I'm going like, wow, and we're, uh, we're an average and there's gonna be, and if we keep up the pace, we're gonna be more than average in, in terms of the snowpack. But who can guarantee this next year? Who can? We have no clue what California is gonna bring. We have no concept of it. It might be a torrent next year. It might be next five years of absolutely no rain. So we have to manage our water systems very, very well in order to make sure that we all continue having water. So it's uh, the Department of Water Resources, that, that's mainly what it does. And now, uh, it's just gonna jump back a little bit. You'll, sometimes people confuse the Department of Water Resources uh, with the, Depart uh, the Water Resources Control Board. And they're the ones who actually uh, deal with water rights. Uh, they deal with how much water is going to be released uh, for the salmon during the fall or uh, how much water is going to, who gets what water. So 
the Department of Water Resources, we're, we're just the conduit. We're just the delivery system. We're, we just convey water to you. That's our objective. Ultimate objective is not to do what they call the water grab. We got, we basically have the water we have and we have to manage it and we got to get it from each, uh, each particular point. Uh, so I'll be talking more about that too as we go along. And then we got recreation and recreation is an easy thing. It's about having fun at our lakes. So uh, we're gonna, I want you to visually see our state water project. And as we know, everything starts in the Sierra snowpack. That's our, basically our water bank. And these are our upper lakes. At the end of the presentation, you'll get a map with all these things so you can reference them. So these upper lakes are basically the, uh, the, the beginning of the, uh, the state water project. This is the California aqueduct, that's its known. Here at San Luis, it's very interesting. Uh, this is a completely man-made lake doesn't have no natural uh, spring to it. So we pump in water and then we can pump w water back out. So it's one of those situations where we use the energy to pump in and then uh, we can store a lot of water and then when we need it, we pump it back out and generate electricity. They're exactly at that, the uh, Giannilli pumping and generating plant right there. As you can see, the, uh, the, uh, the aqueduct smaller there is heading towards Santa Barbara.
And you notice the rise of land. Every time the land rises, we have to have a pump. So, the, uh, so you'll you'll notice a lot of pumps along the way. And as, but then when the land uh, uh, goes down, when it's a lower elevation, then we have a generating plant. This is our, our biggest uh, pumping plant there. And once it gets water over uh, the grapevine, we'll call it, then it, uh, we have our east and west. This is heading west, heading towards LA. see this lake uh, next to I-5 on your way to LA. This is our terminus pretty much. This is uh, the, the most southern lake here, Lake Paris. So we're talking about, north to south, we're talking about 600 miles worth of a, of a water project. And so it's 29 contractors that we deal with, and you just happen to be one of them. So the enterprise is really, really, really massive. Uh, so, and that's, our, that's the idea. We want, you, we want everybody to be informed about how massive the enterprise is in terms of what we do there at the Department of Water Resources. So, so just to, kind of to get into it, so we, we do, what we do is water control. We're controlling uh, the way we, the, uh, we deliver water, we store water, how we deal with, with floods and droughts. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons we had to do this, uh, back in 1950, there was, uh, there was a huge population boom after World War II. Uh, we went from, as you can see back in the 1900s, there was less than two million people here in California, and we jumped over to uh, 10 million people uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a matter of uh, uh, a few decades. And now uh, the California population is up about 38 million people. And remember I said there was a 27, the number 27 earlier, 27 million. Well, the State Water Project serves about 27 million people. And that's so many people. So you, thi you think about we're serving, we're serving more than half of the population. About, uh, so we're talking about a huge part of the population benefits itself from the water that we deliver. And of course, we're also uh, benefiting agri agriculture and the manufacturing industry. 
Um, just, a, uh, just as a, w one of the things I wanted to kind of bring into mind since it's raining, and we're always talking about the factors of precipitation, uh, I just want us to quickly, uh, let me see if I can get in here. Uh, let me see, there you go. Uh, let me see, can I shrink this up a little bit here? There it is. As you can see, uh, what, I, what, I want, what I want everybody to notice, we're here at this uh, uh, point right about there. And as you can see, the, uh, the, the curve here tells us what an average year looks like. And we're having an awesome year. We're having an average type of year in terms of rain. Uh, we can point to uh, 2016 and 2017. You can see how much rain we had then. So we're talking about where everything is in the safe zone in terms of flooding and things of those possibilities. But then we're talking about what droughts look like. And so as much as we can have a lot of rain, we can have uh, droughts. So uh, that's one thing to always keep in mind is, is what's, what's, uh, what's going on. And then one thing I want to point out at this point is you can access all this information that I'm clicking onto at our website. Uh, and you'll, you'll see it's a water at, uh, dot ca, uh, water at ca .gov. Uh, And I urge everybody to go explore, explore our website. It's full of information. And it's, uh, we're making sure it's relevant to you, that it's easy to read, that it's easily, easily digestible. Because uh, 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 there's no, there, it's no fun if it's a secret. We, we all got to be in on it. So, uh, so this is a team effort in terms of, uh, of, of how we manage our water resources. Uh, and so I mentioned uh, 27 million people. And then we do uh, the agricultural sector. It's, uh, we, be, uh, we, uh, we benefit about 750,000 acres of, uh, uh, and through irrigation. Uh, in contrast, most of the, uh, most of the uh, farmers get their water either locally uh, through our uh, underground water pumps or through the federal government, uh, uh, the Central Valley Project. And then the Central Valley Project compared to the state, they benefit about five, um, uh, about um, of their nine, mil uh, nine million acre feet that they supply in water, five of those go, five million of those go to the, uh, to the, uh, to the um, agricultural sector. So they, they, they're, they're really, uh, they really uh, wor work with the agricultural sector while the state water project is, and the Department of Water Resources is basically working with the urban sector. As we mentioned, there's 29 state water contractors uh, and um, uh, each typically receives a percentage of the maximum water allotment depending on their need and the amount of precip precipitation that we receive that winter. So that's why you'll never see 100% uh, allotted to the state water contractors because there's a balancing act going on. But this is determined by the, 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 the Water Resources Control Board. So th they determine how much water is going to go out to every, every contractor. Uh, and then there's a, a uh, as you can see, there's a, a map with all the 29 uh, state water contractors. Uh, and again, uh, you guys are here in this area. And this is all your regions you cover. And so uh, if water's free, why does water co cost so much? And this is where we get to the uh, other interesting parts. It's a, it's a delivery system. The delivery system the energy, the infrastructure to maintain it, to repair it, to modernize it, everything you saw in that video, and, there, and that's just, that was just an eight, million, eight minute video of the 600 miles worth of, of, uh, of a project. Uh, that's what costs so much, that's what costs so much, but yet, it's in, in the overall scheme, uh, state, uh, uh, state water contractors know it's probably the cheapest water they can get because all the other sources are more expensive. So, and so, and talking about energy, uh, the State Water Project is the fourth largest hydropower producer, but also it's the biggest energy user in the state. So as much as we produce a lot of energy, we use a lot of energy. So, uh, so, uh, so uh, they're, they're, I've been to the control room, they're buying energy by the minute, or selling energy by the minute. There's a whole room of people just buying and selling as, uh, as they need to do this in order to transport uh, water uh, on its way south. Uh, so I wanted to kind of point out at this uh, elevation, elevation changes provide opportunities for generation to help our pumping needs. So you can see on the way down, uh, on the way down, uh, everything is uh, gravity. We have to have uh, pumping plants in order to get it up to the next level. So this is pretty much if you're looking at the state water project uh, at a sideways view. So you're thinking 
they're thinking as, uh, every time it goes up, there's a pumping plant, pumping plant, pumping plant, pumping plant. And then when it comes down, there's a, a, a uh, power plant to generate power. So, so you can understand this. And so and this pretty much gives you a good idea uh, from north to south what it looks like on a sideways view what the, what the, the, the uh, state water project looks like. And so in terms of, uh, of uh, thinking of a lift, the biggest lift is right here at this, uh, uh, at this red dot. And that's over the Tehachapi Mountains. Uh, we call it the grapevine near, near Bakersfield. And we're talking about to lift up 1,900 or so uh, feet over the Tehachapi Mountains. We're talking about 14 pumps, 80,000 horsepower. That's similar to uh, technically 14 747 uh, jet engines. That's a lot of energy to get that water up. And that's happening every day in terms of getting water up there. And we're talking about uh, lots, 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 lots of uh, football, football size of, uh, of uh, 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 we call this cubic, uh, cubic feet per second, right? The cubic feet per second, we're talking about for, per second, we're delivering four, over 4,000 footballs, uh, oh no, basketball, sorry, over the hill, over the hill per second. So it's a lot of basketballs. And then we're talking about flood control. We mentioned that dams are for flood control and drop control. Uh, that, that's a, the, a picture there of the Oroville Dam with the new spillway. So everything's uh, fixed and ready to go there. Uh, the, uh, and so, so uh, dams, are, uh, dams are pretty much there to, to, uh, to, to help with the uh, risk, uh, you know, keeping water there for drought in the summertime periods when we get no rain. And so, but any, any of the issues with the, the uh, levees or the dams, the federal government pay f pay pays for that because th that they're looking out for the safety of the population. Let me, uh, we're and then I wanna mention that the Orville Dam is the biggest dam, the tallest dam and the largest dam in the United States. So, so it's, there's, it's holding back a lot of water. We're gonna get to the Delta. The Delta, is is the hub of the state water project and as i mentioned earlier i just want to bring this into mind that we got to keep it we got to keep it fresh we got to keep the environment alive we got to uh, make it, this thing work in every single way so we got to make sure that uh salt water is coming in through here we got to we, we kind of block it off around here we got to make sure the salt water doesn't get any further than it needs to in order to make everything work to make sure that for water going south and, and it goes to our pumping plant, keeps going south, you keep getting water over here, and all the farmers in this area keep their water. So we're looking out for everybody's benefit. Uh, fish and wildlife protection. Fish and wildlife protection pretty much goes like this. It's a, it's a, it was an interesting thing. I, I took a tour to the, uh, our, one of our, uh, our pumping plants that, were, that sends the, 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 let me go back one, here we go. And it's uh, right there, right there. The Clifton, uh, at Clifton, uh, the Clifton Four Bay. They bring. They basically there's a screen that traps that gets fit where fish get stuck. Every single day, a 24 hour operation. They're taking fish, putting them in trucks, and taking them all the way back from here to here and dumping them back in the water. Because that's the only the, the process that we have right now. Uh, we that's why we got we got we're trying to figure out better ways to make sure fish don't get caught up. And that includes the delta smelt, but we're taking fish every single day, 24 hour a day operation back, back, and that's just it's just a in order to do what we need to do for the environment. Salinity control. We mentioned that. Make sure we keep the water out, fish screens, uh, and then I'd like to mention we have recreation and all our lakes. It's open to the public. Um, if you go to our website, again, you'll find that there's, uh, there, there's uh, maps uh, that you can uh, uh, figure out what to do. We can do all these things. Um, so we invite everybody to go basically uh, use our reservoirs, Lake Oroville, San Luis, and the Southern Lakes. Now, just uh, let's get into challenges. The challenges are climate change. Uh, climate change uh, uh, disrupts the water cycles. We're talking about floods 
and droughts. We have no control over those. The other challenges that we have is groundwater. We have a lot of uh, aquifers being depleted. Land is subsiding, and once land subsides, we can't replace those aquifers. So it's a, right now, that's becoming a big thing. You're, you're, you're here about the term called SIGMA. SIGMA, we have new policies, new, new regulations. So the Department of Water Resources is getting into this right now. Uh, we have a growing population that demands more water. Uh, we demand more food, uh, and we demand more from the manufacturing sector. Of course, with more food, we need more ag agriculture, larger farms, increased perennial crops also. There's a lot more trees. We're talking about almonds. Uh, oranges and things, a tree, uh, a tree has to be watered more than a, 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 than a, than a crop that's a, that's a seasonal crop. So that's a, another challenge because the farmers are demanding more water. Um, we got aging infrastructure. And then of course we gotta make sure we, we, uh, we, dis we distribute water correctly. We gotta make sure we keep our salmon, salmon runs. That's a, a, huge, a huge thing about making sure we have water both for there's a fall salmon run and there's a spring salmon run. And of course, we gotta maintain our ecosystems. If you go to the Delta right now, you'll find big areas where ecosystem restoration is called Eco Restore is happening right now. But these are the challenges to DWR, making sure that we, we do our part. So the call to action, and if you can look these keywords up at our website, uh, you can look up water plan, we can look up water fix, save our water, uh, new reservoirs that are needed, eco restore, renewable energy, infrastructure repair. And these key words will take you to these sites where, you're, where you, you'll learn facts. It's not about a political stance. It's what needs to happen in order to keep our system uh, going. So uh, just to kind of finalize with this part here, uh, the California Water Plan is talking about exactly what we're doing here today. Uh, when we do a collaboration, we we'll all get involved, get connected, and make sure we have input, uh, and then we work for the, for the same thing, for the social welfare, welfare and safety of each other, uh, our environment, and make sure we keep our economic objectives uh, stable. Uh, and so the water plan, I invite you to read, it's a very positive doc document. It's a challenge for all of us to get together, and that's one of the coolest things I was telling, uh, I was telling Marta and I was telling Kristen back there, to be here and be able to share just a little bit because you need whole semester courses just to kind of learn the whole water system. It's a very complex system, but the fact that you're here, it's day one. It's day one of a whole journey and water is a complicated issue, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's a thing that uh, the more you learn about it, the more interesting you get every time. It's complex. Every, every time you go to a different place, a different region, a different district, a water district, a local, uh, it gets complex, and then if you add politics to it, it just gets more complex. But so we're talking fact. We're talking fact. So, so any questions? So, as I would look in the video, two questions came in my mind. Number one is um, you talk about p having to pump the fresh water to keep the water, um, the salt water not enter our system. My question to that is, um, instead of using fresh water, could we have used water that go through the, the solid night um, patient technology? So that way we don't have to use like, you know, completely fresh water. That's number uh, one. Okay, yes, no, so just think about it. It's our little delta versus the ocean. Right. So we need a whole lot of water. Like I mean, we need the whole, the whole, the whole system, the whole push of the of the river, the whole pressure. So it's not going to be just the like the. Uh, it can't be just one one pipe. It has to be a whole river, the course of a river. If that makes sense. So so you can't possibly uh, filter all this kind all this water and, and to create that pressure because it has to be uh, real time pressure, not not just uh, uh, waiting for filtration systems to happen. Okay, so I, I guess I have to process that to understand that. The other question I have is in regard to the energy that we use to maintain or you know um, drive our water from point A to point B. Uh, the question for that is, with you know the current technology of renewable energy such as uh, solar, are we taking advantage of that? Because all the places that, that I saw in there, it seemed to be very bare. Uh, there's nothing there that probably uh, taking advantage there's, of that there's a, uh, there's, a, there's a mandate right now for, uh, 
for the sta all state agencies to go through a uh, to f reconfigure by 2050 and figure out how to get uh, energy from a, a more sustainable way. So w it's in the process right now as we're, 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 we're looking right now at the different uh, possibilities. So of course, any, kind of any type of renewable energy is gonna be uh, happening because it's a mandate now. One more. And I, and I can hang out afterwards and answer all kinds of questions. Thank you for the presentation first. Thank you. And uh, uh, the question is, I think it's related to what my uh, partner here mentioned, is it any part of this, uh, the project of desalination from taking water from the ocean and, and treat it so it could be uh, drinkable or usable? That, I that's know it's very expensive no, technology. I understand. So yeah, because we mostly deal with uh, Sierra, Sierra water. So, so uh, the desalination process is more of a, at a local level. So it, it, it has to be basically you got to look at it at the local level because we're only dealing with Sierra water mm -hmm. at this point. And 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 the organization deals. Uh, I did not uh, hear anything regarding the treatment of the water. Uh, again, it's a local. It's a local thing. We local. just deliver the water. Okay. All right. Thank there you. you go. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. And I'll be hanging out afterwards, and you can ask me all the questions you want. I got until 10 p.m. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everybody. Rafael, and thank you so much for coming up from Sacramento this afternoon. Uh, we really appreciate the information. Um, so we are at 7.10. We're a few minutes behind. I want to ask the group, would you guys like to proceed or take a few minutes for a bathroom break? Yeah. I know that we had in the agenda about five minutes. So um, if you guys are okay with that, we hopefully we'll catch up later and not keep you too late. So for everybody, it seems like they want a little bathroom break. Is there a consensus? Yes. yes. Okay. So let's take a five-minute bathroom break and then we will resume with um, how our local water infrastructure operates and with welcoming remarks from our CEO, okay?
All right, everybody, I think we're going to get started. Um, I know you guys want to chit-chat, but in order for us to get out of here in time tonight and respect everybody's time, I want to keep us on track. So, uh, but before we get started, just want a few quick a little announcements. Um, each of you should have received in your program packet a pre-survey just to kind of get an idea of what you know before the session. So hopefully you guys fill those out and trim them in. And then at the very end of the session, we're hoping you can fill that out again to see kind of, you know, where the increase in education is. Um, and it's not a test, you're not being graded, it's just for us to evaluate the effectiveness of our program. We also have a program evaluation at the end. If you could fill that out just to give us feedback on the speakers tonight and the program, that would be great. Um, and then finally, before you leave tonight, if you guys could all return your badges, because we will be reusing these um, at each session. Um, and then the other note is in your program binder, um, you guys all have the bios for the speakers. so. Just in case you want to read up more, there's more information in here. Um, so now we're going to welcome our CEO, Norma Camacho. Uh, she's been with the Water District since 2012 and was appointed by our Board of Directors as our CEO. So without much further ado, I'm going to give her the mic. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, it's really a, a pleasure to be here tonight with all of you. And I'm really excited about all of the things that we're going to be talking and learning about water here tonight. And um, hopefully all this information that we impart on you that you will share with your neighbors, your families, your friends on all the projects that we're putting forward and 
you know, basically any of the issues that we bring up that you're feeling very important to your community as well too. And so I want to thank our chair for being here today, Chair Razad, and really sharing her priorities that she had talked with all of you about. And I want to thank uh, Rafael Chavez, our guest speaker from the State uh, Department of Water Resources, and uh, basically the information, the overview he provided on how our whole water system works. And as you can see, it's a really complex system. And it is really important to us here because over 40% of our water supply is coming from that system because we are both a state and federal water contractor and so we do rely on those supplies. But of course, we're going to be supplementing those supplies for future growth that, are, that is gonna be occurring in this area. And so as the uh, chair mentioned earlier tonight, we do have a very multifaceted mission and we are really unique upon, you know, compared to a lot of the water agencies that are out there who are much more single focused. Um, we do drinking water, but we also provide groundwater management uh, for this area, as well as flood protection and flood risk reduction. And also we're an environmental agency as well, and we do try to protect the environment and protect the watersheds in this area. And so in the last few years, if you've been you know, reading the paper, that we as an agency have dealt with severe drought which was then ended by extensive flooding in this area. And so we made a lot of strides in this agency to be really nimble and try to deal with both extremes and that we're dealing with today. So as examples of some of the uh, things that we have done uh, when it comes to flood, flood risk reduction efforts, that uh, we've made a lot of progress on developing short-term and uh, some medium-term solutions to protect or provide more flood protection along Coyote Creek on the areas of Rock Springs that were impacted in 2017 uh, by the floods. And then also, uh, we recently completed a construction on the San Francisco Creek, and so that was a huge project that provides uh, flood protection to both East Palo Alto and Palo Alto from flooding. And that allows us, actually the completion of the project allows us to provide more flood protection upstream in that project. And so other significant flood protection construction projects that we've made a lot of progress on include Permanente Creek, uh, which is going on right now, and the upper and lower Berryessa Creek projects. And the upper Berryessa Creek projects we have just uh, completed as well. And for lower barrier, so we have one last piece to do on Lake Cunningham. And so when it really comes to all of the water supply planning and preparing for the future, we really have to take a really close look at our water supply portfolio and to deal with a lot of these extreme changes in our climate that we're dealing with today. And also trying to deal with a lot of the issues regarding sea level rise along the South Bay. And so we're really working hard to develop uh, a lot of scientific models of our system to estimate how much water we're going to be needing. Um, and we are con continually trying to refine all of the plans that we're making for the future to ensure that we can deliver that safe, clean water to this community and meet the demands of growth that are projected into the future. And so uh, to ensure that we do remain sustainable, we have to focus on those investments that are going to secure uh, both our existing supplies, making sure that we can still get those supplies, as well as expanding our portfolio to include more extensive water conservation, to look at a lot of water reuse efforts, to look at um, implementing advanced purified water systems to allow for local resiliency. And so it helps us to optimize our structure and create that local resiliency that we do need. And so, um, you know, we have also been exploring, I don't know if, uh, if some of you have heard about the Pacheco Reservoir Project, but the Pacheco Project is going to be able to allow us to increase storage and improve our water supply. And this is a, a project, a, a reservoir expansion that's right next to the San Luis Reservoir. And so it's going to help us capture those water on those high flow years that come through, you know, you saw on the graph that uh, Rafael had put up on 2017 when we had that massive amount of water that came. Well, a lot of that could not be captured because there was no capacity to store it within our systems here. And so 
just to talk about some of our environmental efforts as well. Uh, we are being good environmental stewards, and I just wanted to go through some of the uh, types of projects that we do for the environment as well. Like many of the annual creek cleanups, I know some of you have participated in that, that we work with the community and volunteers to remove trash from our waterways. Trash is, is a real big concern, and we have an Adopt the Creek program in place in order to help uh, uh, commu the community and ourselves work together to keep all of the cre creeks clean. Uh, we also do a lot in the community in terms of hosting green gardener certification classes to teach people how to conserve water and reduce waste. And we are also in the process, too, of uh, actually um, cleaning up Almaden Lake. Um, as many of you know, there was a lot of historic mercury contamination that occur occurred in Lake Almaden, and we are in the process of restoring uh, the physical habitat there to make it uh, more protective to the fish in the area. And um, also, uh, we do have a lot of efforts under our Safe Clean Water Program and Natural Flood Protection Program, and we have been working really hard on the fisheries and aquatic habitat. Collaborative effort to ensure that the, um, that the steelhead in our streams that we have here continue to exist here and that we provide the environmental stewardship habitat to uh, allow that to continue forward. And so these are just a few of the highlights of some of the progress that we made. I know that Marta is gonna go through a lot of the rest of our progress in a lot of details, but I just wanted to give you a short synopsis of, of what we do do, and also um, you know, just expressing my appreciation that you're all here tonight at 7.25, and, and really wanting to learn about water, so thank you very much. Thank you, Norma. All right, guys, I'm gonna bring you here home to the home stretch. <laughs> um, so I have a lot to cover, so I'm just gonna jump right in and get started. I know many of you might have questions, so I ask you please hold them to the end. Hopefully by the end of my presentation, I've answered most of those, but if not, we'll have some time for some Q&A at the end, um, either for me or for Rafael or from uh, Norma or, or Rick. Um, and so just to get started, our presentation that I have, let me actually pull it up. Um, uh, I'm going to really cover the district's history, our mission, our organizational function, as well as some of the key projects that benefit our entire community. Now this is gonna be kind of an overview and a primary, some of the things you may have already heard through um, Chair Lazat and our CEO, Norma. Um, but at the next two sessions, we're really gonna dive a little bit deeper into these areas. We're gonna have a presentation at the next session that's gonna really focus on kind of water supply and water utility issues. And then our third session will be all about our watersheds and environmental uh, stewardship work. Um, and then we'll have a field trip on March 23rd where you guys will actually go out to some of our facilities and get to actually see it for yourself. So. So, all right, so let's get started here. So let's begin with a little bit of history. The Santa Clara Valley Water District got started in 19, um, 1929 with a mission of really managing our groundwater um, basin. Believe it or not, the area that is now known as Silicon Valley used to be an agricultural area known as the Valley of Hearts Delight. During those days, a lot of our water was being pumped out from our groundwater basins, so much so that parts of our valley was actually beginning to sink, much like Central Valley is today. That's, why, that's called land subsidence, and it's something that we very much manage and guard against today. So let's talk about our mission. Uh, managing groundwater is still part of that, but we have a three-part mission, which is to supply clean, reliable water that's relatively affordable, to provide flood protection, and to ensure healthy creeks and ecosystems through environmental stewardship. So now I've kind of told you our mission and a little bit of our history, but so first, I mean, really, who are we? I know a lot of times people confuse us with the San Jose Water Company and other water providers. So we are a public government agency, meaning that we are not a private or investor-owned utility. We do not answer to shareholders, but we do answer to the public and to taxpayers. That is why the water district is governed by an elected board of seven members, um, which are equally divided um, geographically by seven areas throughout the county. 
Right now, tonight, we are in District 4, which is represented by Chair Lazat, but not too far from here is District uh, 6, uh, represented by t uh, Director Tony Estramera. Also, to ensure kind of uh, coverage throughout the county, we also made sure that um, for the ambassador program, to s we selected three from each of these seven areas. And so finally, we also have a budget of about 510 million. Much of it slated for maintenance, repair, or modernization, plus approximately 800 employees. So let's talk a little bit more about clean, reliable water. As I mentioned earlier, we have three pillars. Our board is charged with protecting the quality of the water that we bring to those that we serve here, which is nearly two million residents and commuters in 15 cities throughout the county. We also provide water for 4,700 private well owners. But unless you have a well on your property, you most likely don't get a bill from us. That's because we manage the overall county water resources and infrastructure system, much like Rafael explained about the state, we do that here locally. And we also provide, as a wholesaler, water to 13 local water providers. Um, those are cities, municipalities, or privately owned uh, companies. So most likely you get your water bill from one of those 13 water providers. So now we're gonna talk about water supply. And as you guys probably have figured out from Rafael's presentation, you guys have uh, heard that we import water here locally. Um, there's often a mis misconception out there that only Central or Southern California imports water, but we also import water and it makes up a huge percentage of our water supply portfolio. And that helps us to meet and weather through droughts and meet the demand of an increasing population. So in an average year, we import about 55% of our water supply through the Delta. 40% is through the Delta and 15% is through Hetch Hetchy. We also get 30% from our local uh, sources such as rainfall, rainfall and storm water runoff from our reservoirs. We also very heavily focus on water conservation, so that makes up another 10%, and then 5% is through water recycling, which we plan to increase to 10% by 2028. So I, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about our groundwater management. I really like this graph because I think it does a good job of explaining kind of the, the work that we've done to manage our groundwater basins through time and as well as the innovation. So now that I've explained kind of the different water sources, where does that, all that water go? Most of it goes into the ground. A fun fact for all of us is that our groundwater basins here locally hold more water than all of our 10 surface water reservoirs combined. So it is a huge storage bank for us um, that really comes in handy when we have emergencies like drought or when we need extra water to make up that shortfall when we don't have enough local water. So why is groundwater so important? The simple fact is that groundwater is a finite resource. If we pump out more water than we replenish, we will run out of groundwater. It, is, it also leads to land subsidence, which is basically the permanent sinking of land. Um, and once that water is removed and the land sinks, it cannot be recuperated, it cannot recover. So we really need to make sure that that groundwater basin is healthy. Um, this is a huge problem because it can lead to seawater intrusion or salty water into our fresh drinking water sources. It makes uh, certain communities more susceptible to flooding and it can damage infrastructure such as underground pipes as well as bridges or roads and that all is very costly. So once it starts to sink, we cannot recover that. So I also have a little prop right here. I know um, some people are visual but this little sponge to me kind of represents what our groundwater basin kind of is underneath the ground. As you see, it's full of water when it rains or when we inject the water, it's full. But once we start pumping it out, you know, it's a you know, little dry sponge. But if we really start depleting this, we will get to the point where this sponge becomes this. It's flat, it's shrunk, and we not, cannot recuperate that groundwater basin once the land sinks. So it's very important for us to manage our groundwater supplies. So let me talk a little bit about this graph um, in front of us. The blue line on here represents our groundwater levels over the course of time. The green line represents our population growth over the course of time. And the orange line at the top represents our land surface elevation. So as you can see, up until 1970s, this land surface elevation was dropping um, until we halted and really worked towards um, recuperating that groundwater. 
So in certain parts of San Jose, there is about 13 feet where the land has sunk, mostly in North San Jose and Alviso. So um, let's explain this little chart a little bit more of how we were able to manage and how we've been innovating. In the 1930s uh, and 1950s, we built reservoirs to capture local rainwater to replenish our groundwater basins. But then severe droughts and population growth really started straining our um, resources. So you can see here in the graph, you know, it starts to go up, but then in the 1950s, we need to start really looking for more water supply. So that's when we really started importing water. So in the 1950s, we began importing water from the Central Valley Project, or I'm sorry, from the State Water Project in the 1965. Um, then in the 1980s, we also imported water from the Central Valley Project, which is the federal government uh, project. Then in the 1990s, we really started focusing on water conservation efforts and rebate programs to kind of keep us, you know, going and keep that, you know, groundwater from tapping too much into there. And then now, currently, we're looking at water recycling and water reuse for the future for a sustainable local supply where we don't have to import or get from other sources. So now that I've talked about our groundwater, um, and as you saw in the previous slide, imported water from the Delta makes a huge significant supply or makes up a huge you know, supply for us. However, um, over the last few years, we've seen a downward trend in the amount of imported water we receive. This happens basically because pumping in the Delta frequently gets shut off due to regulatory agencies to protect fish and wildlife that also depend on that water. So that's why in May of last year, our board voted to participate in the California water fix. Um, it's the state's plan to improve reliability of the aging infrastructure that carries water to the Sacramento San Joaquin or through the Sa Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. An important benefit of the water fix is that we wanna ensure that we keep the same amount of imported water um, available to us. Um, we also wanna make sure that we have a voice at the table and that we're able to advocate for water supply reliability as well as balancing those environmental needs and benefits. So now that I've talked about that, um, along with the water fix project, the water district is also working to expand local storage and improve water quality and reliability by increasing, um, and also increasing environmental benefits by expanding the Pacheco Reservoir, which you guys have heard a little bit about. So currently, this is a very small dilapidated reservoir between Santa Clara and San Benito counties. Um, as you see in the map, there's San Luis Reservoir. It's really nearby. It's the blue body of water on here. And right now, the San Luis Reservoir is currently used by both state and federal water contractors to store water that's imported from the Delta. So it's kind of like a little storage bank. Um, that includes us. We store water there as well as being a contractor. But there are challenges with using this reservoir. Uh, so some of the reasons why we are looking to expand Pacheco Reservoir is to minimize drinking water taste and odor problems due to algae blooms that happen at the San Luis Reservoir. So I don't know, some of you who may have experienced during you know, the late fall or, or late summer that you know, the, the water may taste funny or musty or has a taste or odor, that's due oftentimes to the algae blooms in the San Luis Reservoir. Um, so we also, because of that, um, are trying to minimize supply interruptions due to that uh, lower point in the San Luis during the late uh, summer and early fall. Um, expanding the reservoir would also reduce our reliance on that reservoir when it's low and allow us to recharge more groundwater um, to ensure compliance with the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. It also allows for greater flexibility as being one of the contractors uh, by uh, providing additional storage elsewhere. Also, there are environmental benefits to this project for fish, and it also helps reduce flooding for nearby watersheds. Uh, also, this project is expected to cost about $1 billion, but the California Water Commission has approved and awarded funding of $485 million under Proposition 1 for us. So that's almost nearly half of the project cost that we've been able to cover through um, funding through Proposition 1. And really, that's a great demonstration of the district's commitment and hard work to ensure that you know we spread out the cost and it's not all on the ratepayers or on homeowners or property tax, really to secure affordable water supplies for our county. Under the board's leadership, we are constantly looking for alternate sources of funding whenever we can, whether it's grants or federal or state funding or others. So during our next session, we'll actually ha have invited um, 
our CFO, Darren Taylor, to come and talk a little bit more about our budget and how we, our revenue and how we make money. So we'll get more into that at the next session, but just wanted to cover those points while we're here on Pacheco. So we are also looking at exploring water recycling and water reuse through the um, through this facility here, which was built in 2014. It is our Silicon Valley Advanced Water Purification Center. Um, and really, we are trying to ensure that we have a sustainable and locally controlled water supply, no matter what extreme weather the changing climate may bring. Uh, this facility basically takes recycled wastewater and purifies it to a level that's so advanced that it's basically nearly distilled 100% pure water. Right now we use that water to enhance our recycled water program, so it basically is used for non-potable reuse, um, meaning that it's used for irrigation, uh, landscaping, um, industrial you know, uses. However, this water um, really does meet and even exceeds drinking water standards, so it really <laughs> has a lot more potential uses. Um, and because it's you know good for the environment and it's sustainable, we were really looking towards taking this supply and really looking at how to augment our drinking water supply through recycled and purified water. So you guys will have get have the chance to take a tour of this facility on March 23rd, and you guys will learn a little bit more in depth about it. But just to summarize the uh, process that's involved, the water goes through microfiltration, reverse osmosis, and ultraviolet light. And that basically at the end of that process, it's 100% water. So whatever you know, it started off as, it's no longer because we are basically replicating Mother Earth in the, the, cycle, the regular water cycle through advanced technology. So now that we've talked about these different water supplies, um, we're gonna talk about a little bit about how our local water system, how we actually you know, transport that water and fill our ground water basins and move it from us to our, the water providers and then to your homes. So our water infrastructure helps us deliver these services through 10 dams and surface water reservoirs. We manage 270 miles of streams out of 800 total in the county that, we're, uh, that we own and operate, and then 142 miles of pipelines and 400 acres of recharge or percolation ponds throughout the county. I don't know if some of you have seen, if you've been in different parts of the county, there's little ponds out there and sometimes they're dry and sometimes they're full of water. Well, those are percolation ponds or recharge ponds that basically we manage to uh, make sure that we recharge the groundwater basin. So they're areas that are more permeable and uh, allow for that nice groundwater recharge. Also, we also operate three water treatment plants and the uh, advanced purification center as well as a water quality lab. So um, much of the um, infrastructure that I just mentioned though is aging and needs maintenance and repair. Many of our facilities were built in the 1960s and they need repair or modernization. Our capital improvement project, which is revisited every May during our budget process, includes 61 projects with a value of 4.2 million billion. These projects are either planned or underway over the next five years, but some will take much longer than five years to complete. Examples of some of these projects includes retrofitting Anderson Dam, which is our largest reservoir in South County, as well as Calero and Guadalupe. The retrofit is basically to make sure that we meet the seismic uh, retrofits that are required by the state, because when they were built, it was before those regulations were in place. Uh, this also includes modernizing our oldest water treatment plant, which is in Rincon the Rinconado, Rinconado Water Drinking Treatment Plant in Los Gatos. It was built in the 1960s, um, and it's continued to operate as we do the, the work that needs to be done. Also, we have a pipeline rehabilitation program to inspect pipes and repair those um, that are deteriorating. All these capital improvement projects are really essential if we are to deliver on our promise of delivering safe, clean water. So just like when our water heater breaks at home and we need to replace and spend money you know, on our own home infrastructure you know, to maintain or a car, we also need to maintain and repair and modernize our own system uh, to deliver that water to you know, the county. Um, in addition to securing and moving water throughout the county, we are also responsible to make sure that we have both safe and clean water. Um, and so that means taking, um, that we take that uh, mission pretty seriously with uh, operating a state-of-the-art water quality lab. We test water from our three water treatment plants, from our advanced water purification center, from our reservoirs, and from our groundwater basins. 
Each year we perform well over 170,000 tests which consistently meet or exceed all applicable, applicable water quality regulatory standards. Um, and these standards are becoming increasingly stringent as new technology is developed to detect contaminants at very minute levels. So that was part one of our mission. So as you can see, that was quite a lot. Um, and now I'm gonna talk about part two of our mission, which is flood protection. Um, the water district is the flood control agency for Santa Clara County. And that means that we invest and execute projects and programs to protect lives, homes, and businesses throughout the county from flooding. To date, we have invested 1 billion in flood protection efforts and have protected nearly 100,000 parcels. We have 17 more projects planned um, to protect another 25,000 more parcels. However, we are also up against the, the, the real challenges of climate change and the impacts. I've been at the district for six years now, um, and in those six years, I've experienced both, you know, one of the most severe droughts in the history of California, immediately followed up by a very extensive rain and flooding in 2017. The reality is that the climate has changed and this may just be the tip of the iceberg. This photo here is flooding from Coyote Creek in Rock Springs area in San Jose. And although um, the district had kept Anderson Dam well below capacity by releasing water all season, the onslaught of atmospheric uh, storms really hit us hard um, and we just could not keep up with mother nature. However, many hard lessons were learned and we have been hard at work to make sure that we provide additional protection to this area as well as others throughout the county. Since then, we have implemented short-term fixes um, such as the construction of an earthen berm and vinyl, pile, or vinyl sheet pile wall that will help protect the Rock Springs area. We also are working with the city of San Jose to remove 15 acres of non-native vegetation along um, that area that clog up the creeks and we've developed an emergency action plan with the city of San Jose that outlines kind of our action plan during any different types of flooding scenarios. Long term, we're also working on getting flood protection projects completed in that area and we've recently partnered with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to develop a feasibility study for reducing flood risks from Montague Expressway to Tully Road. Another part of uh, our flood control includes maintaining streams. Um, and we have a stream maintenance program that basically takes place all year long. Well, we can't do this for every stream, but really the ones that have flood protection projects completed. Um, so from June to October, our crews are actually out in the streams, repairing banks, clearing debris like in this picture, and managing vegetation to allow water to flow through our creeks more readily. And during storms, our crews are often out there as well, clearing debris that could slow water, for, slow water flow and cause flooding. The last part of our flood uh, protection program also includes increasing community awareness. We work with partners throughout the, out the county to increase community awareness about how to protect ourselves from flooding. Through our flood protection activities and community outreach plan, we are able to get points from the federal government and from FEMA that wind up saving us, or saving our community money on flood insurance rates in participating communities. So far, we have helped Santa Clara residents save up to 15% on flood insurance premium through the work that we're doing in terms of community awareness. Um, we always encourage preparation. Um, so please have your emergency uh, kits ready in your um, bags tonight. You guys probably received a little flood emergency kit, um, but also you know, make sure you have an emergency plan um, and sign up with the Ready SEC Alert app that gets you know, information out to people whenever there is any kind of local emergency such as flooding. Um, the other you know, side of the coin though is droughts. Um, the truth is we really don't know when the next drought will strike. This picture here is actually of Almaden Lake at the height of the drought. And that's why it's important to remember to make conservation a way of life. During the drought, our, bar, our board called for water use reductions of up to 30%. Um, the community really came through with about 28% in 2016. The board has continued to call for voluntary reduced water use, aiming at 20% reduction for uh, 2018. Uh, so this is something that we just are continually working towards in promoting water conservation. Uh, because most water waste is outdoors, the water district also offers landscape rebate programs that help replace grass with native and drought tolerant plants. 
we offer one dollar per square foot of converted turf. Uh, to help encourage the public to save, we have offered a variety of other rebates as well um, and other programs such as water audit surveys, rebate programs for gray water systems called laundry to landscape, new rainwater capture programs for rain barrels, cisterns, and rain gardens to collect roof water runoff. So thanks to these conservation efforts, our water use has been pretty consistent despite population growth by 30% since 1980. So now this brings me to our, the, the, the third pillar of our mission, last but not least, which is to provide healthy creeks and ecosystems. Environmental stewardship is central to all our work throughout the district. So this little guy here staring at us is a salt marsh harvest mouse, a native to the area. And as part of our environmental focus, we take care of streams and watersheds. We restore and improve habitat. We partner with other agencies to provide trails and recreation opportunities through our grants and partnerships. We host creek cleanup days. We work to prevent polluted runoff. And we work with the creekside property owners to help them be good stewards of the streams and ecosystems. We also work with other agencies to address issues such, to, such as homeless encampments which cause extensive environmental damage. So the water district's environmental work protects and restores habitats and encourages the return of endangered species, such as the red-legged frog, steelhead trout, and salt marsh, salt marsh harvest mouse. Um, and in addition to that, I just mentioned our creek cleanups. You know, we can't do it all on our own, so we rely on the community to help us achieve milestones to protect the environment. We have an Adopt-A-Creek program that lets volunteers help keep our waterways clean, and we participate annually in the Coastal Cleanup and National River Cleanup Days, um, which are hosted twice a year. Uh, creek, cleaning creeks and streams helps really protect the health of the Bay Area and beyond. Our next uh, National River Cleanup Day is on May 18th, and I encourage all of you to come out and volunteer with us. You could either sign up as a site coordinator or as a volunteer by going to this website, cleanacreek.org. Uh, last year, we had 1,354 volunteers. Uh, we picked up 47,353 pounds of trash and cleaned 64 miles of um, creeks. That was just for the National River Cleanup Day. So as you can see, the, the volunteer efforts really do have an impact on our creeks um, and in, on our environment. In addition to that, we also run uh, several programs to help prepare our future water stewards. One of those programs is the program that you're all part of, the Water Ambassador Program. Um, and we also have a uh, education outreach team that goes out into schools. We see nearly between 13,000 to 15,000 students a year. We also run a youth commission as part of that. We run public tours at our recycled and purified water center. Um, and we do a lot of just community events uh, to really, really educate the community about water and environmental stewardship. So um, that really kind of concludes my presentation. We have these two websites where you can get more information. Like I said, at the next two sessions, we'll have a little bit more in-depth um, sessions on the water supply and water utilities issues, and then on our watersheds and environmental issues. Um, this here is, if you want to stay in touch, I hope you all do. Uh, these are all of our social media uh, handles. Um, but as part of this cohort, we will be definitely engaging and sharing more information on these projects as they unfold. Um, the whole purpose is to keep you guys engaged and informed in real time. And so um, with that, I hope you guys, you know, uh, learn as much as you can and stay engaged with us. So uh, for now, I will open it up to questions. Um, we got about 10 minutes. Um, and so I'll open it up for some questions. And then at the end, we'll have our chief of external affairs come close do a closing remarks and take us home. Yes. Uh, if we have a, a school in our town, is this on? Yes. Thank you. Uh, say in Morgan Hill within the Unified School District and they wanted to uh, have somebody come and talk to them about local water issues. Would we contact you? Yes, or? I'm the right person to contact. Yes, Thank you. I run that program and will definitely um, you know, just shoot us an email and we'll definitely make that happen. Yes. Um, I just want to ask, I guess, like, can you give us an overview of really what you want us to do as stewards? Because I think I didn't see the specific things that you actually want us to do. 
Well, really, I think it's, we really want to just in, in communicate and educate uh, just the community members that are out there. I know, you know, there's only 800 of us and 2 million residents, and so a part of this program is to educate people so you could take that information and help uh, inform other, you know, if you're part of a community neighborhood association, or if you're part of a Rotary Club, or a Kiwanis Club, or whatever it may be, to share and pass along that information to others uh, so that they're also aware of what we do. So that's kind of one of the goals of the program. The other is to really build a network of water ambassadors and to stay engaged so as uh, new projects come about or issues in certain communities, you guys will be you know, alerted as part of that contact database so that we can get that information out to you and in turn you could get it out through your channels, through next door, through social media. So it's kind of a two-way communication but also starting with that basic education um, and just getting the community more aware of what we do and who we are and why we're, you know, what are the benefits that we provide for the community as a whole. Yes. I grew up in the Midwest uh, where in sometimes uh, in the older homes you would see cisterns in the backyard where they captured all the water off the houses. Uh, why don't we do that out here? If, if water is so uh, such a rare um, substance, why don't we capture the water off of uh, the rainwater and, and use that? A great question. Um, I think people have gotten away from that, um, but I, you know, we are definitely promoting um, you know, conservation and sustainability, and we just have launched a rainwater capture rebate program. So the district is offering rebates to encourage people to do exactly that. Mm -hmm. So um, I have a flyer that captures kind of all our water conservation programs, and you guys will get more information and actually an entire presentation on water conservation at the next session that you know, they can get more into that. But that, that we're definitely on the same page. Um, any other questions? A quick one. You mentioned about the water conservation program and, mm -hmm. and the rebate. Uh, is that information on our water uh, web page? Um, yes. Okay. And then the second one is to address the concern with the comp conservation of water that mm -hmm. comes some consequences, for example, like mm -hmm. breeding mosquitoes. So hopefully that would be included in, uh, in that information so people can be aware and, uh, and not to get into that problem. So, so we don't want to breed another problem from this current problem, is that what you're right, saying? Right, right, right. Yes, and we work with other agencies like the county and the public health department. Um, there's always information and education of how to you know, mitigate mosquito problems and West Nile virus. And we know, you know, uh, I think you know, with the changing climate, we're gonna see more of that. And so we have to be you know, just kind of on top of all those things. Um, and then to answer your other question about water conservation, all that information that I just went through is on our website, and we do actually have a fact sheet that kind of lists all of our water rebate programs. So you guys will be getting that at the next session, including a um, more in-depth presentation. So um, I think we're at the end of our session, and I wanna be respectful and make sure that you guys are able to get home. I know we have people here from the North County and South County, so I wanna make sure that they get out of here on time. So I'm gonna invite our Chief of External Affairs to come up and give us our closing remarks. Thank you. And, and, and thank you to Marta. Marta is the one that really pulled this together. I'll ask the other staff to come in. I'll have some random idea of what we're going to do. And about a, about a year and a half ago, I went to the board and said, you know, I'd like to be able to uh, do something and create something. I, actually, I think you may have been in the audience. And we said, well, create something where we can pull together people in the community to see what we did. And, see what we do and see if we can have them be able to talk about what we do. And that was, and so Marta came up with this wonderful idea. And so you, you uh, are, get to be the first cohort here. So you know, I wanna thank Marta for her leadership on this. It's, uh, you wouldn't be here without, without her and her leadership. So, so thank you very much. So, so I, I just wanna start off with just a quick show of hands, just cause I, I know you all introduced yourself, but I was just trying to figure out um, how many years the folks have been here? And one of the things I always have found valuable in these kind of programs is the interaction with each other and getting to know the folks that are here. So hopefully during the course of these four classes that you'll have coming up, you'll get to, get to know each other a little bit more. But just sh show of hands, who's been in the Valley for 50 years or more here? Okay, a couple folks, how about 40 years? Or, okay, 30 years, around 30 years? Uh, 20 years, 10 years or less? Okay, so, so we have a, a good complement 
of folks here that have been able to see things, including seeing what was really the, the Valley of Heart's Delight, as um, Martha had mentioned. My, my family moved out here in 1976. I'm a local product of the school system of here. I went to Santa Teresa High School. I, I remember growing up, I would you know, walk to school and I would see the gates of, it was say the Santa Clara Valley Water District was Canoas Creek. And that was a shortcut for me to get to high school. So we would cut up the creek and we would be able to go through. So I, I was always happy when people would cut the gates of the Santa Clara Valley Water District because I could get to school <laughs> almost 15 minutes quicker by cutting along the creek. So this entity, the Santa Clara Valley Water District got tired, I guess people were cutting their gates and they put up these, these bars, to, uh, to, but the bars worked as steps for us to climb over the gate <laughs> in order <laughs> to get to school. So I, so I remember going up saying, you know, who is this Santa Clara Valley Water District? So long story short, wh when I was done with college, came back to the community, been working in politics for a while, my mentor said, Rick, you should go work for the Santa Clara Valley Water District. They're looking for a government relations manager. And, and the first thing that came to my mind is, well, who wants to go and work in water? I didn't know what they did. I just like, water, you know, I'd come from working for Ron Dellums in Washington, D.C. It was a much different place. I'd worked for Susan Hammer. So I, I was saying, and she was the mayor of San Jose. So I'm, I'm looking at basically what I thought was excitement. I said, and you want me to go work in water? He says, Rick, this is a, it's a good industry. You know, people love to work in water. So I said, okay, I'll sign up. You know, I, I'll apply for the job. And, you know, you know, long story short, I end up getting the job as a, the government relations manager. And I didn't know what to expect. I was much younger than uh, 20. In fact, we're talking at the table. I've been here for 24 years. When I first came, I said, okay, I'm only going to stay here for five years because I know that water is boring. You know, <laughs> what is there, what does politics and water have to do with one another? There's no, correct. <laughs> what are politics? Like, what, and people say, oh, Rick, you know, Mark Twain had the saying, you know, what are, uh, whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting. I'm like, ah, whatever. You know, water is not that political. I have never seen as much politics in this building throughout the state of California as people fighting over water. So not only are you the first cohorts here, you, you're going to get the f a front row seat into really understanding what goes in. And I heard Raphael talk about the fact that people think, you know, water comes out the sky, water is for free. Why are you charging me for water for something that's just coming into my backyard, that's falling off my roof? It should be free. I shouldn't have to pay for it. People don't understand, but you will be the first 21 people I'd be able to explain in the community. This is what it means. This is what goes on. I don't know who raised their hand and asked questions. I'm not quite too sure what you're looking for from us. Well, help, hopefully you'll be able to help us with that as well. Because, you know, I, I'm, I'm on next door. How many in the, in the room are next door? So ho hopefully, I, I would hope all of you are next door. One of the things is just last week on, on next door in my community, I saw someone was posting about, yes, yeah, it's, it's, um, I hear that they have opened the, uh, opened the outlets to Anderson Dam, which wasn't true. And they said, and the reason why they opened the outlets to Anderson Dam is they mismanaged the utilization of Anderson Dam last time and they let too much water out and that's the reason why the community flooded. So I sit here and just shake my head and so, so I basically, I, I, I jump on next door and I say, you might wanna go check this press release so you'll have the true facts. Because what happens on the internet, you know everything on the internet's true. <laughs> so, so, so that's what happens. People see that and then people say, oh, this is what happened. So what, what I'm looking for from you is what I would hope for from you, and I hope this is what you would hope from, from, from yourselves, is that when you see things, you say, hey, I know where to get the answer from. Or if you've gone through, you can just point a link. Or you can say, hey, you know, I might be able to help with this, and you shoot the information over. So the more ears and eyes we have in the community, the more people that we have like you, the community leaders, to say, here's what's going on, the more opportunities you have to get on our commissions and our committees, you will hopefully see what I saw, what I didn't see when I was younger. Actually, water is exciting. Flood protection is exciting. The environment is exciting. And we can't do it without people like you in the room in order to make it, make it happen. So I thank you for being here. And just to close, you have a few next sessions coming up. The next session is going to focus on the water utility side of the house, where you'll get to hear a chance from subject matter experts and how our water utility works. Following that, you'll have a third lesson will be on the watershed side of the house. We've had some briefings on this, but we'll, we'll, dig, we'll dig down deep. We'll talk about what's going on in the watersheds. We'll talk about not only our stewardship, we'll talk about how the flood protection projects work. You know, often we're, we're, we'll have people that say, you know, I passed by that pond. Why is that pond gated? You know, those might be percolations ponds we're talking about. We'll talk about the infrastructure that you pass by in the community. We'll talk about the gates 
that close off Kanoas Creek that when I was a high school student, I used to <laughs> hop over. And you'll understand, well, how do we open those gates in order to make those into trails for the community? What does that mean? So you will be the ones that will be educated to basically be able to reach back out. Uh, the fourth session will, will culminate in a field trip. This is the best thing that I think for folks to see. Because once you hear about it, it's completely different to see it. Once we, once we get you out there, you'll be able to go to the places that used to be open into the community until 9-11, like our water treatment plants. We used to have tours for, uh, of our water treatment plants. 9-11 happened. Then you had the Department of Homeland Security said, we've got to protect our community's infrastructure. So you'll be one of the few folks that have the ability to see some of these infrastructure, some of the infrastructure that's not open to the community and be able to see how does your drinking water treated. You'll be able to see things such as the Recycled Water Center out in Alviso. Some of you I know have visited already, but to see how is water purified and it have the opportunity to taste it. You'll get the chance to see not only the flood protection project, but see the history of how it got there. The hopefully we'll be able, I, you know, I was looking at it when they had San Luis Reservoir and I haven't talked to March about what the tour is looking like. And I said, you know, it'd be nice if we can get all the way out to San Luis Reservoir on the tour, maybe take, take a look at Anderson to see what really happened in terms of what, what rainfall, what happens when the water goes over the spillway, be able to get out to the Santa Teresa Water Treatment Plant, the Recycled Water Center, be able to look at an environmental stewardship project and have you back home in time for lunch. No, that won't happen. We'll have you back, <laughs> but we'll have you back home in, in time for the end of the day. And then finally, the final session, our fifth session will be your graduation, where we have the opportunity for the entire board of directors to honor you for being the first cohort to go through this, uh, this leadership academy, through the ambassador section, to basically be able to thank you and then provide you your graduation certificate. And we'll have a, a short reception before that. So I'm looking forward to having the chance to not only meet each and every one of you during these sessions, to attend the sessions with you, but also for you to meet each other. And often, I've, I've been through many leadership courses, and it's not just what you learn, but who you learn about in the end. Hopefully that when you leave this, you'll have friends from throughout the valley, from Palo Alto down to Gilroy, that, you, that you, if you hear something, you'll say, hey, you know, this person may be in this profession, I can reach out to them and they can help me. I think this is a good opportunity. I thank you for sharing your time with us because I know your time is valuable. Thank you, look forward to seeing you at the next class. Quick, real quick, I have uh, a brochures and maps of the State Water Project. So everything I, I spoke about is in this information, so come by, pick it up. Thank you all. All right, thank you. We'll be around if you have questions. Um, otherwise, um, please fill out your evaluations and return your, you can leave your badges right on the table and we'll use these for each session. Um, but please make sure to fill out your post survey um, and the, e the session evaluation. So it's two forms that are in your binder. Uh, we really appreciate that. Thank you.